that the no strategy of the Republican Party for 2022 is to keep voters from voting. And guess what? Ms. Clark will run the voting rights section of the department. On the final vote, only one Republican, Susan Collins of Maine, joined Democrats to confirm Clark. As Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Clark will be a key player in moving the Biden administration's civil rights agenda. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. A family-friendly street festival, musical performances, and moments of silence were held today in Minneapolis to honor George Floyd and to mark the year since he died at the hands of Minneapolis police. A death captured on wrenching bystander video that galvanized the racial justice movement and continues to bring calls for change. Floyd's sister Bridget and other family members held a moment of silence at a celebration of life event at a downtown Minneapolis. Minneapolis Park that included music, food trucks, and a vaccination stand. A few miles away at the site of the intersection where Floyd died, dozens of people kneeled around a steel fist sculpture for several minutes, symbolizing the 9 minutes 29 seconds during which Floyd was pinned down. Other members of Floyd's family met in Washington with President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, who urged Congress to quickly pass a law in Floyd's name that would bring changes to the nation's policing. Christina Honested reports. The first anniversary of George Floyd's murder at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer was supposed to be a milestone moment in Washington, a time to mark the passage of a police reform bill to make justice more just. But instead, Floyd's family met with President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris at the White House, continuing to push for legislation. Floyd's nephew, Brandon Williams, spoke to reporters after the meeting. We're very appreciative and grateful that the uh, president and vice president invited us here. I think that the meeting went well. He showed um, concern. And um, I think genuinely he wanted to know exactly how we were doing and um, what he could do to support us. And he did let us know that he supports passing the bill, but he wants to make sure that it's the right bill and not a rush bill. Um, He also said that um, he set that deadline. Um, He's not happy about it not being met, but... All in all, he just wants the bill to be right and meaningful and that it holds George's legacy intact. George Floyd's murder sparked nationwide protests and calls for police reform. In response, House Democrats passed legislation named after him, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. The sweeping bill would end qualified immunity, making it easier for individual police officers to be sued and charged with crimes. It would also ban chokeholds, limit no-knock warrants, and create a national database of officers with histories of complaints and disciplinary problems. It would also give the Justice Department greater discretion in investigating patterns of police misconduct. But nearly three months later, it's still pending in the Senate, even though Democrats control both chambers. That's because they need support from at least 10 Republicans to overcome a bill-killing filibuster. GOP lawmakers have preferred more modest changes. Family attorney Benjamin Crump says police reform shouldn't be a Republican or Democratic issue. It should be that we all want better policing. We all want just policing where George Floyd would get an opportunity to take a breath without having a knee on his neck, where Breonna Taylor would get to sleep in peace without having her door busted open and executed with six bullets in her body. Their blood is on this legislation, so we're going to continue with this family and these, uh, this legal team to continue to press to say, yeah, we have to look at this as a national issue that we have avoided dealing with far too long. The chief stumbling block has been qualified immunity. Progressives and criminal justice reform advocates are insistent the bill eliminates protections for individual officers. But Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky has said he won't support any bill that ends qualified immunity. It's largely due to police opposition of ending the protection. Some Democrats, including Senate Democratic Whip Dick Durbin of Illinois, have said they could see a compromise on the issue. With the police reform bill still pending, 
Floyd's family began the day meeting with Democrats in the House. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Representative Karen Bass of Los Angeles, who introduced the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. She's also working with a bipartisan group of lawmakers to push it through the Senate. She pledged to send the bill to the president's desk. I stand here to renew the commitment that we will get this bill on President Biden's desk. We will get this bill on the desk. And what is important is, is that when it reaches President Biden's desk, that it's a substantive piece of legislation. And that is far more important than a specific date. We will work until we get the job done. After meeting with Democrats and President Biden, Floyd's family also met with Republican Tim Scott of South Carolina, the only black Republican senator. He's negotiating with Democrats, Senator Cory Booker and Representative Bass on the police reform bill. While Biden is waiting for the bill to hit his desk, his administration at the Justice Department has announced a sweeping investigation into the police in Minneapolis and Louisville and brought federal civil rights charges against the officers involved in Floyd's death, including Derek Chauvin. But civil rights leaders like Reverend Al Sharpton are not giving up and also want to see passage of legislation. Sharpton spoke at a commemoration of Floyd's murder in New York. It was one of dozens of actions marking the day. We want to see the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act passed by the Congress. When we saw a movement like this, In the 60s, it led to the Civil Rights Act of 64. You cannot have a movement that is of any way, shape, and form progressively successful if there is no legislation. We must have legislation that defines and refines what police excessive force is all about. And it must come from a federal level So states cannot opt out and go whichever way they want. Sharpton spoke and gathered with lawmakers, Democrat Hakeem Jeffries and New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. They kneeled for nine minutes and 29 seconds. The length of time, Officer Derek Chauvin pressed his knee into Floyd's neck, killing him. He was found guilty of murder. Actions also took place in Los Angeles, Minneapolis, Oakland and other cities across the U.S. and abroad. Biden said after speaking with congressional negotiators, he's hopeful sometime after Memorial Day, there will be an agreement. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. On this anniversary of George Floyd's death, activists in Oakland gathered in the downtown to reiterate their calls to defund the city's police. KPFA's Sam Anderson reports. The death of George Floyd sparked nationwide protests. And what emerged from that movement were sustained calls to defund the police and redirect those resources into the community. In Oakland, city council members and Mayor Libby Schaff have publicly pledged to reevaluate police budgets. But one year after George Floyd's death, Mayor Schaff instead released a city budget that increases funding for the police. Here's Kat Brooks, co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project and a host of KPFA's Upfront. Libby Schaaf released a tone-deaf budget that did not move resources away from police and into community, but actually gave them more money. We are here today to demand City Council fund the Just Recovery budget, that City Council invest in the strategies for reimagining public safety, and to reinvest dollars into the communities that need it most. The proposed city budget allocates $350 million to the police by 2023, an increase of more than 10% compared to the current city budget. It also includes half a million dollars for a study to research locations for a new police headquarters, though the new headquarters itself is not included in the city budget. Activists say the increase is at odds with her public pledge to invest in non-law enforcement methods of public safety. In the year that followed Floyd's death, several city governments have taken steps to defund the police and hold officers accountable for acts of violence. Police budgets have been reduced in more than 20 American cities. But police reform advocates point out that black people continue to suffer from police violence on a regular basis. I think one of the questions that's been asked repeatedly on this one-year anniversary has been, what's changed? George Galvis is the executive director of Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice. And when I try to reflect on the answer to that question, unfortunately the answer is not a whole lot. Police didn't stop killing us. It was something like 64, 65 people murdered by police in this country just during the course of the trial of Officer Chauvin. 
excited. They've had the opportunity to make change right here. And if we can't make change right here in Oakland, California, then where is it going to happen? Since the death of George Floyd, his name, along with names like Breonna Taylor from Louisville and Jacob Blake from Kenosha, have become familiar to Americans across the country. But the Bay Area has its own list of names. James Birch, the policy director for ABTP, asked the crowd to say them aloud. Miles Hall, say his name. Miles Hall! Tanadu Akobi, say his name. Tanadu Akobi! Sean Monterosa, say his name. Sean Monterosa! Eric Salgado, say his name. Eric Salgado! Joshua Pollock, say his name. Joshua Pollock! Tyrell Wilson, say his name. Mario Gonzalez, say his name. Mario Gonzalez. Steven Taylor, say his name. Steven Taylor. Dewan Armstrong, say his name. Dewan Armstrong. And all of the names I list are in the Bay Area alone. Activists pledged to continue to put pressure on Oakland City government to hold police accountable and redirect funds away from the police department. Oakland City Council is currently conducting public hearings on the city budget and will send their recommendations to the mayor later this month for a budget that must be finalized by June 30th. Reporting for KPFA, I'm Sam Anderson. In Minneapolis, the security patrols sponsored by the large Native American community continue a year after the mass street actions in response to Floyd's murder. Antonia Gonzalez of National Native News has that story. Lisa Bellinger is executive director of the American Indian Movement. She says members of the Native community were among those to show support for Floyd's family at 38th and Chicago, the site where George Floyd was murdered on May 25th during an encounter with police. The protest, vandalism, and violence which followed impacted nearby Native businesses and housing. Bellinger credits AIM patrols for helping much of the community survive but says recovery is slow. We started patrolling every night, you know, every day, every night. We worked with the housing community nearby the Earth, and we patrolled businesses. Here we are a year later. We've endured the, the aftermath of all of the riots and looking at rebuilding, but yet I sit here back on Franklin Avenue and across the street from us, the building's still boarded up. Bellinger says over the last year, they've hosted patrol trainings with other communities, taken part in a unity police reform group, and says unrest in the city was compounded by the pandemic. We have been doing some addressing trauma activities like having a sacred fire where just people can just come and put tobacco on a fire and smudge off with some of the theater phase. Having a cultural gathering and holding community prayer circles. And we we even have a, a sewing and beating night utilizing our culture and our teachings and our traditions to just process throughout the trauma of the pandemic and the trauma of the riot. Bellinger says citizen patrols are out as events and remembrances for Floyd take place. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno. Online at kpfa.org. Police reform was a major theme of the legislative session in the state of Washington this year, and lawmakers passed bills that banned certain police tactics, such as chokeholds, adopt a de escalation standard that makes deadly force a last resort, and make it easier to decertify officers for misconduct. Eric Tegatoff reports. The Washington Coalition for Police Accountability is made up of families who have been affected by police shootings. Fred Thomas, whose son was killed by police in 2013, says this session has been historic. As a coalition, we are just elated that so many of them have actually made it through the process without being changed too much. Many police groups supported or remained neutral on the reform bills. Only the decertification bill raised major concerns. The father of Trish Andra Pickup's four children was killed by a police officer in 2019. She's raised concerns about the investigation into the killing. This session, lawmakers passed a measure creating an independent office to investigate police killings of civilians. Pickup hopes these types of reforms can save lives. Police are human beings. They deserve respect. Any human being would deserve. But the people they kill are also human beings. 
Thomas says one of the bills also ensures more citizens are involved in oversight. It creates five positions for community members on the Criminal Justice Training Commission. He says the public's involvement in holding law enforcement accountable is important going forward. There are going to be departments who just are not going to follow the new rule if nobody is watching them and calling out on it. So it's time for the public to actually watch and demand that things are done correctly. For Washington News Service, I'm Eric Tegedoff. The Senate today narrowly confirmed Kristen Clark to be the Justice Department's civil rights chief, making her the first black woman to fill the high-profile role. The Senate voted 51 to confirm Clark, with Senator Susan Collins of Maine as the lone Republican to support President Biden's nominee to lead a powerful division of the Justice Department that's in charge of investigating police abuses and enforcing voting rights laws and federal statutes prohibiting discrimination based on race, sex, religion, and other factors. Christopher Martinez reports. The yeas are 51, the nays are 48, and the nomination is confirmed. With that narrow vote, Kristen Clark has become the first African-American woman, indeed the first woman, to head the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division since it was created in 1957. Democrats were united in supporting her nomination by President Joe Biden. Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer praised her during the Senate debate. When it comes to justice in policing, the criminal justice system, and at the ballot box, the Civil Rights Division is often the tip of the spear, conducting investigations of police departments with patterns or practices of constitutional violations, and defending the fundamental voting rights of every American citizen. So in a way, as we continue to pursue strong policing reform legislation, it is appropriate that we confirm Kristen Clark, a proven civil rights leader, to the position of Attorney General, Assistant Attorney General, where she can continue the fight against bigotry in many ways. It is appropriate we do it today. Kristen Clark is the daughter of Jamaican immigrants. She grew up in public housing in Brooklyn before going on to Harvard and Columbia Law School. Democrat Dick Durbin of Illinois calls her confirmation historic, noting that it comes on the one-year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd by police. Under President Trump and Attorney General Session and Barr, the Civil Rights Division was devastated. Over the past four years, the division rescinded guidance protecting transgender students, prohibited the use of consent decrees with local police departments that engaged in syst systemic misconduct, and abandoned its prior legal position supporting Americans' fundamental right to vote. I believe America needs a civil rights division that vigorously defends the civil rights of all Americans. Kristen Clark is the legal expert we need to restore and reinvigorate the Civil Rights Division. Clark has held several jobs in the Department of Justice, as well as working for the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, and most recently, leading the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. But her activist history was not to the liking of Republicans, who say she wants to defund the police, a claim she denies. Tom Cotton is a Republican from Arkansas. He called Clark not just partisan, but extremely partisan. She casually slandered 200, 200 sitting Senate-confirmed judges as white male extremists. If confirmed for this position, she will be entrusted with representing the United States government in front of those very judges. Not exactly a credible advocate for our people, if you ask me. Ms. Clark's radicalism doesn't stop with ad hominem insults. It thoroughly infects her professional judgment as well. Ms. Clark has consistently demonstrated that she's more interested in attacking police and calling everybody a racist than finding the facts or reviewing the evidence. When it comes to racially incendiary cases, she proudly fans the flames of division. Democrat Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island spoke in Clark's defense, noting that she has been endorsed by conservatives like former Republican National Committee Chair Michael Steele, as well as several police organizations, including the major cities' chiefs association. She ought to have flown through committee and been a quick vote here on the floor. But no, it's hair on fire time again. Why all the quaffs aflame? Look 
behind the smoke screens. And remember that the number one strategy of the Republican Party for 2022 is to keep voters from voting. And guess what? Ms. Clark will run the voting rights section of the department. On the final vote, only one Republican, Susan Collins of Maine, joined Democrats to confirm Clark. As Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Clark will be a key player in moving the Biden administration's civil rights agenda. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The House Administrative Subcommittee held a hearing on voting in America, including voter ID laws, proof of citizenship laws, and lack of multilingual support. Mary Sherman reports. In the House, lawmakers and experts debated voter ID laws. Today, voter ID laws represent one of the nation's most important barriers to voting and thus one of our country's most important civil rights issues. Michigan State political scientist Nazita Lejavardi says voter ID laws can hamper minority turnout. Matthew Campbell with the Native American Rights Fund says that includes Native Americans. For many Americans, obtaining identification is a simple act of going to the local DMV. But given the isolating conditions Native Americans live in, the high levels of poverty, lack of access to transportation, the distance to the DMV, the process is far from simple and in fact, severely burdensome. Republicans noted an ID is typically required to buy alcohol or pass through airport security. The Senate has yet to take up the For the People Act, which opponents argue would render voter ID laws unenforceable. For Pacifica Network and Public News Service, I'm Mary Sherman. Emily's List has announced a group of 27 Republican incumbents in the House of Representatives. It will actively work to defeat in next year's election due to what it calls their extreme anti-woman, anti-family agenda. Four Californian Republicans are on the list. Central Valley Republican David Valadeo and Southern California Republicans Mike Garcia, Young Kim, and Michelle Steele. Emily's List says they are in districts that could flip to Democratic candidates. Emily's List had previously announced it would target nine Republican governors and three Republican senators. They are Florida's Marco Rubio, Charles Grassley of Iowa, and Wisconsin's Ron Johnson. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It is an hour-long newscast each night, airing at 6 o'clock, except for tonight, because if you were listening at the top of the hour when the news is supposed to come on, it didn't come on. And that could be a preview of where we're headed. Yeah. Zippa was on. Nothing. There was nothing there. And if we continue to raise money at the rate we're raising now in this fund drive, that could be a consequence. There could be on-air cutbacks, reductions. Can't tell you. It's not my job. I'm just a, a news guy. I'm not the manager. I don't, tell, I don't decide who gets paid. But I can tell you this. This is news. We're far behind in terms of reaching our goal by the end of this fund drive this coming weekend. Way behind. And it's getting worse. It's not getting better as we approach the finish line. Tonight, the news is challenged to raise... $750 in matching fund. I don't know how much of an audience we've got since we weren't around the first seven minutes of the hour. But if you stuck with us through the dead air and you have some financial resources that you can give to this listener-sponsored station, this listener-sponsored newscast to keep us on the air... I'm asking for it, and I'm asking for you to help us make this $750 matching fund before we go off the air. And we're already behind because I felt that I should bring you enough news to uh, qualify for this for being an actual newscast and not just some fundraising scheme. So, at any rate, 
Without further ado, if you're listening in Southern California to KPFK, call us at 818-985-5735. Your contribution doubled. If you're able to give the average donation of $100, it would be worth $200 to us at 818-985-5735. Or you can do it online at kpfa.org. Likewise, if you're in Northern or Central California, your contribution of, say, oh, five dollars a month, that'd be sixty dollars in total, that would be worth a hundred and twenty dollars to us. If you're able to donate five hundred dollars, that would be great. It'd be worth a thousand to us. One eight hundred four three nine five seven three two if you're in Northern and Central California. One eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. Three two or online at kpfk.org. Now, despite having lost 10 minutes, practically 10 minutes to this newscast, I'm still obligated to bring you the most important news of the day, so I cannot linger here and cudgel you verbally to do this, to make a donation. I got to move on. So the phone number in Southern California, 818-985-5735. The phone number in Northern and Central California, 1-800-439-5732. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has vowed to rally international support to aid Gaza. He made the statement during a visit to Israel and after meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today at the start of a regional tour to shore up last week's ceasefire that ended the latest Gaza war. Israeli airstrikes killed 258 Palestinians. Twelve Israelis died in rocket attacks from Hamas and its allies in Gaza. Blinken mourned the deaths of Israelis and Palestinians. Losses on both sides uh, were profound. Casualties are often reduced uh, to numbers. But behind every number is an individual human being, a daughter, a son, uh, a father, a mother, a grandparent, a best friend. Uh, And as the Talmud teaches, uh, to lose a life is to lose the whole world, whether that life is Palestinian or Israeli. In a move certain to displease Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, Blinken also announced the reopening of the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem. That move restores ties with Palestinians that had been downgraded or cut by the Trump administration. Meanwhile, thousands of Israeli police are engaged in Operation Law and Order, a massive roundup of Palestinians in Israel suspected of committing crimes during protests in a number of mixed Jewish-Palestinian cities during the recent conflict. 1,550 were arrested with 150 indictments, 74 arrests on Sunday when the new operation began. As Corey Peterson-Smith, the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, told up front this morning, it's important to bear in mind that the ceasefire did not bring a halt to all hostilities. Thousands of Israeli police are rounding up hundreds of Palestinians because it calls to mind what many Palestinians were warning us uh, as the ceasefire was being negotiated, which is to stay vigilant. Uh, they may call this a ceasefire, but that might what that what that does is it pauses aspects of the violence, in particular the Israeli uh, bombardment of of Gaza uh, with. The, bombs and uh, artillery um, and, uh, you know, rockets uh, returning from Gaza, that might pause, but the displacement, um, the many other forms of, of, uh, of, of violence, the, the checkpoints, the apartheid, these are ongoing. And actually, within hours of the signing of the ceasefire, uh, there were Israeli police shooting rubber bullets at uh, Palestinians outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Uh, and, of course, now we see this massive police operation and the, the displacement in Jerusalem, uh, which really was actually the, the beginning. That's how this latest round began, was people resisting the disp- displacement in Jerusalem and then uh, Palestinians in Gaza intervening on behalf of, of what was happening there. That continues. So the big take is, uh, of course, there's a certain 
relief that the the kind of onslaught uh, on Gaza has paused for for the moment, um, though Gaza remains under its 15 year blockade and, and so on. And that is one aspect of a whole set of violence that really continues. And so it's really important given the fact that I, I do think this has been a different conversation uh, in this country, certainly about this latest round of, of violence. It's important that conversation continue uh, because the violence continues. Corey Peterson Smith, Middle East Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, spoke with the program up front today. More than 500 people who worked as staff members or organizers for President Biden's presidential campaign have written an open letter urging him to hold Israel accountable for its actions and lay the groundwork for justice and lasting peace. The letter cites what it calls the horrific violence in recent weeks in Israel and Palestine and says the signatories remain horrified by the images of Palestinian civilians in Gaza killed or made homeless by Israeli airstrikes there. It also condemns Hamas rocket launches on Israel. But the letter focuses on U.S. support for Israel. It says the status quo of Israeli expulsions of Palestinians from their homes in East Jerusalem, the occupation of the West Bank, and the blockade of the Gaza Strip meets the definition of the crime of apartheid under international law. The letter by former Biden campaign staffers urges 10 actions, including a demand that Israel allow a humanitarian corridor in Gaza to allow for the evacuation of the injured and for the supply of life-saving medicines and that it take action to protect Palestinians in Israel subject to ongoing violent attacks by Israeli mobs that operate with the protection of Israeli police, that according to the letter. President Joe Biden will hold a summit with President Vladimir Putin of Russia next month in Geneva. The face-to-face meeting between the leaders comes amid escalating tensions between the U.S. and Russia in the first months of Biden's administration. The White House confirmed details of the summit today, Press Secretary Jen Psaki. We don't see this meeting as an opportunity to just talk about everything we agree on. We see this as a diplomatic opportunity for the United States, one that's in our national interests, which is to convey areas where we disagree. We're not suggesting that at the end of this, that is going to be easy breezy from here. Uh, In fact, we continue to expect that we'll have difficult conversations. We will have confrontations at points about areas where we have disagreement. But this is an opportunity to move toward a more stable and predictable relationship with Russia. The leaders' June 16th meeting is being tacked on to the end of Biden's first international trip as president next month when he visits Britain for a meeting of the group of seven leaders in Brussels for the NATO summit. Biden proposed a summit in a call with Putin in April. The European Union has banned Belarusian planes from landing at EU airports and is urging European airlines to avoid Belarus airspace. The moves are aimed at punishing the country and its authoritarian president for forcing a passenger jet to land at a Belarusian airport so authorities could arrest an opposition journalist who was on board. The EU also imposed sanctions on officials linked to Sunday's flight diversion and urged the International Civil Aviation Organization to start an investigation into the incident. Five calls of support, financial support, five pledges thus far as we try to raise $750 in matching funds by the end of this newscast, despite the fact that we were not on the air at the beginning of the newscast for some unknown technical failure. 1-800-439-5732. Your contribution to keep this newscast on the air to keep this radio station on the air will be doubled if we're able to make our goal. 
Five seven three two or online at kpfa.org. And if you're listening in Southern California, the number there is 818-985-5735, 818-985-5735 or kpfk. Org. The Washington Post reported today that Manhattan's district attorney has convened a grand jury that is expected to decide whether to indict former President Donald Trump or other executives at his company or the business itself. Should prosecutors present the panel with criminal charges, the Post cites two people familiar with the development. The Post says the panel was convened recently and will set three days a week for six months. The paper says it's likely to hear several matters, not just the Trump case, during the duration of its term, which is longer than a traditional New York State grand jury assignment. Generally, special grand juries, such as this one, are convened to participate in long-term matters rather than to hear evidence of crimes charged routinely. The Post says the move indicates that District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr.'s investigation of the former president and his business has reached an advanced stage after more than two years. It suggests, too, that Vance believes he has found evidence of a crime. If not by Trump, then by someone potentially close to him or by his company. Investigators have been looking at Trump's business practices before he was president, including whether the value of specific properties in the Trump Organization's real estate portfolio were manipulated in a way that defrauded banks and insurance companies, and if any tax benefits were obtained illegally through low property value assessments. The district attorney is also examining the compensation provided to top Trump Organization executives. An indictment against Steve Bannon was dismissed today over the objection of prosecutors who said it should stand despite ex-President Donald Trump's decision to pardon his former chief strategist. The dismissal came in a written ruling by U.S. District Judge Annalisa Torres, who called it the proper course. The Manhattan judge said it was not the practice of the region's federal courts to remove a defendant from a case's docket without resolving the indictment. And she noted that the pardon does not by itself render a defendant innocent of the alleged crime, nor eliminate probable cause of guilt. A spokesperson for the prosecutors declined comment. Bannon's attorney, Robert Costello, said he was delighted, saying winning always beats the alternative. An unconditional pardon is final, and it merits the finality of a dismissed indictment. Bannon had pled not guilty to charges that he and three others defrauded donors in a $25 million fund to build a wall along the nation's southern border. In July, lawyers for the others charged in the case are to submit potential trial dates for their defendants later this year. House Republican Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy has finally criticized George's Marjorie Taylor Greene for comparing the mandate that House members wear masks while they're on the floor if they don't have proof of a vaccine compared it to the Holocaust. Five days after Greene first made the remarks, McCarthy says in a statement, Quote, Marjorie is wrong in her intentional decision to compare the horrors of the Holocaust with wearing masks is appalling. The Office of the Minority Whip, Republican Steve Scalise, says he does not agree with the comments and condemns the comparisons to the Holocaust. There was a growing wave of condemnation from Jewish groups, some mainstream Republicans and others. Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer weighed in. This morning... Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican Congresswoman from Georgia, once again compared preparations taken against COVID to the Holocaust. These are sickening, reprehensible comments, and she should stop this vile language immediately. Over the weekend, Green doubled down, saying she said nothing wrong. She added that, quote, I think any rational Jewish person didn't like what happened in Nazi Germany, and any rational Jewish person doesn't like what's happening with 
overbearing mask mandates and overbearing vaccine policies. You're listening to the evening news on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian Edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. Eight calls of support, eight donations thus far towards our matching fund of $750. We do need your financial support tonight. This fund drive is in deep, deep doo-doo. Deep, deep doo-doo. That means we're not likely to make it to our final goal, which means it's ever more important that we get as close as possible. Because let me tell you, that goal is not some um, aspirational figure, would we say? No, that's a reality-based figure, that goal of several hundred thousand dollars. That's money that is spent already or going to be spent. It is budgeted money. It's not padded out with anything. It means if we got a cut, it's going to cut flesh and bone. 1-800-439-5732, the number to call if you're in Northern and Central California. If you're in Southern California, 818-985-5735. 818-985-5735, Southern California, or go online at kpfk.org. 1-800-439-5732 in Northern and Central California or at the website kpfa.org. Your contribution doubled the need dire. The White House said today was to be the day the country would reach 50% of American adults fully vaccinated for COVID-19. President Biden has set a goal of having 70% of all adults receiving at least one dose of the vaccine by the 4th of July. Children as young as 12 could soon have a second vaccine option. Moderna said its trials of 3,712 to 17-year-olds showed its vaccine triggered the same signs of immune protection in kids as it does in adults. Moderna said it will formally submit the findings to federal regulators early next month. Pfizer already has been approved for children as young as 12. Meanwhile, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says it has documented a total of more than 10,000 breakthrough infections with the coronavirus among fully vaccinated adults. It says that number is likely a substantial undercount of such infections since most are likely not reported or may be asymptomatic. Among the reported breakthrough infections, 63%, nearly two-thirds, occurred in women, and the medium age was 58 years. The 10,000 reported breakthrough infections at the end of April were among more than 100 million people who had been vaccinated. White House Corona Vice, coronavirus advisor Andy Slavitt says we need to get to the bottom of the origins of the pandemic pathogen and the World Health Organization and China need to do more to provide definitive answers for the global community. The precise origin of the virus remains undetermined. Speculation has reigned about whether it jumped from animals to humans or whether it could have escaped from a Chinese government lab in Wuhan, the city that saw the first outbreak. We need a completely transparent process from China, Slavitt said at today's coronavirus task force briefing. Dr. Anthony Fauci said, many of us feel like it was a natural occurrence, but we don't know 100% and it's imperative to investigate. We feel strongly, all of us, 
that we should continue with the investigation and go to the next phase of the investigation that the WHO has done. So because we don't know 100% what the origin is, it's imperative that we look and we do an investigation. And that's how we feel right now. It is our position that we need to get to the bottom of this and we need a completely transparent process from China. We need the WHO to assist in that matter. We don't feel like we have that now. We need to get to the bottom of this, whatever the answer may be. Um, and that's a critical priority for us. More from reporter Simon Marks. Beijing is resisting calls for fresh investigations into the origins of COVID-19. At a World Health Organization meeting today, Chinese officials resisted efforts by the US and other countries to begin fresh studies into claims that the virus originated in a Wuhan laboratory. China says it cooperated fully with a WHO team that just a few weeks ago concluded it was extremely unlikely that the pandemic began in the lab. Simon Marks reporting. Twelve calls so far. Two people calling right now. We're still trying to raise $750 in matching funds. 1-800-439-5732. Northern and Central California. Southern California. 818-985-5735. <coughs> Excuse me. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio says public schools will reopen for in-person instruction in September with no remote option. De Blasio said it's time for everyone to come back. The head of the union that represents city teachers signaled it would accept the plan, saying there's no substitute <coughs> for in-person instruction. Though it said a small number of students with extreme medical challenges might still need a remote option next fall. <coughs> the school's chief for the nation's second largest school system, the Los Angeles Unified School District, also said students will be returning to the classroom for a full day on campus in person instruction. That means elementary school students will be on campus five days a week for a full day of in person instruction with their teacher and classmates. Middle school and high school students will be on campus five days a week for a full schedule of instruction, changing classrooms for each period. L.A. Schools Chief Austin Bootner said for students who are unable or who choose not to attend in person, an online option will remain available. Over the past week, India has passed two sad milestones in the struggle against COVID-19. The official number of deaths from the pandemic crossed. 300,000 daily fatalities topped a record 4,500. Sadder was the certainty that the true toll on both counts was many multiples higher. Across vast stretches of the country's interior, there's little testing for the virus and therefore few official cases or deaths. Epidemiologists agree that a full tally would put India far ahead of the United States and Brazil in the dismal rivalry for the country with the most people killed by COVID-19. Yet even India's faulty government numbers now give reason for hope. The parts of the country we're counting as fairly, fairly reliable show a clear trend. The virus is Vicious second wave is rolling back almost as fast as it rolled in. Rebecca Bundan reports from Mumbai. India's total number of COVID-19 infections since the pandemic began is now close to 27 million, official data shows, making it the second worst affected country after the United States. New infections may be down compared to surges of more than 400,000 cases a day seen earlier this month, but medical experts are worried that India's COVID-19 figures may be far higher. The spread of the virus seems to be easing in major cities, including Delhi and Mumbai, where lockdowns are in place, but in Infections have spread rapidly through rural parts of the country, where the healthcare infrastructure is much weaker. Rebecca Bundan, Mumbai. One person on the line right now as we move to close out this matching challenge. Still, there's three minutes left. Three minutes left. One person on the line. 15 donations thus far. Please give us a call. 818-985-5735 for those of you in Southern California or go online at kpfk.org kpfa.org the website in Northern and Central California or 
five seven. Three, two. Please join that one person on the line right now. Tokyo officials quick today to deny a U.S. warning for Americans to avoid traveling to Japan will have an impact on Olympians. Japan's determined to hold the postponed Tokyo Olympics scheduled to open on July 23rd. The U.S. cited a surge in coronavirus cases in Japan. Most metro areas in the country are under a state of emergency. Those areas are expected to remain so through mid-June because rising COVID-19 cases are putting pressure on the country's medical care systems. That causes concerns about how the country could cope with the arrival of tens of thousands of Olympic participants if its hospitals remain stressed and so few of its population vaccinated. Almost 2% of people in Japan have been vaccinated. Phoebe Amorosa reports from Tokyo. The U.S. has raised its travel alert for Japan to level four, the highest level on its scale. The move comes as the Japanese government is debating extending the state of emergency, which is currently in place for 10 prefectures. A decision is expected by the end of this week. The rise in coronavirus infections is adding to strong opposition over the Olympic Games, which are scheduled to kick off on July the 23rd. However, the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee has downplayed <coughs> the travel advisory, saying they are fully confident in the virus countermeasures put in place by the Tokyo organizers and that these would ensure athletes' safe participation. Phoebe Amoroso, Tokyo. Unionized registered nurses at the Chinese hospital in San Francisco held a one-day strike today to protest what they say are substandard working conditions and inadequate pay that nurses say has driven experienced nurses away and undermines the hospital's ability to recruit recruit new RNs. And restaurant workers and labor rights activists rallied in San Francisco to kick off two days of actions in at least seven states across the country, demanding a $15 an hour minimum wage for waiters and other Restaurant workers, other actions planned, New York City, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Detroit, New Hampshire, and Arizona tomorrow. One person on the line, the final minutes of our matching period, 1-800-439-5732 or in the Southland, 818-985-5735. Mostly sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs... From the low to the mid-60s around the bay, 80 degrees further inland in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, sunny and hot with a high of 91, partly cloudy in Los Angeles, highs in the upper 70s. That's it for the news tonight. Good evening. ...when our building is closed. We're doing all we can to continue to provide you with important coronavirus information. As conscientious citizens, we must first protect the health and safety of our KPFA community. Thank you for supporting 94.1 FM and listening to KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at KPF.